Welcome, everybody. And as always, thanks to Volvo and uh, ASICS for uh, sponsoring our LA Roadrunner group. And this week, we are going to talk about the Rose Bowl Half Marathon. This is really a discussion on the route. Also, you should know the new one that we are using um, on the Rose Bowl Half Marathon here is has a way more carbohydrate content than the new one that we use at our Saturday morning group. Um, the Saturday morning group only has, that new one has like 25 grams of carbohydrate per gallon. So it's like almost no carbs at all. It's really just minerals and water almost in flavoring. But uh, the new one on the course is actually gonna be different. It's gonna have a lot of carbohydrate and you'll probably be able to sample it on the Santa Monica Classic. I'm sure they will have it there. So let's dive into it. Um, the key element here are the first three miles. This is really a good microcosm for the LA Marathon because the LA Marathon is not the first three miles, it's the first six miles. But here's your Rose Bowl right there that says number one is your Rose Bowl. There you go. There it is, picture, whatever. Number one, Rose Bowl. So um, your starting line is right outside the Rose Bowl. Obviously, this is the finish line right inside the Rose Bowl. We'll get to that way later. Um, starting line goes downhill, actually. Take a look at this. Your first three quarters of a mile, I think you can all see my um, this map and my cursor. Um, the first three quarters of a mile is actually about a 75 foot drop in three quarters of a mile. That's about 25 foot drop per quarter mile. It's not substantial. It's a little more than the drop or gain on Ocean Avenue, but not by much. Um, you're talking about from the starting line to uh, roughly right over, somewhere over here is the um, Aquatic Center, the, the Pasadena Aquatic Center, and or the Rose Bowl Aquatic, whatever they call that huge Aquatic Center right, right over in this area. Um, and if any of you have friends, there is a dirt path that goes up to this little road and will take you right to mile three, which is what I'm going to do. Whoops, right to mile three over here, which is what I'm gonna do. So any pedestrian friends, they can run straight down here, cut across the dirt path, and then you're right at mile three. That corner is where you will all see me, but you'll get to that in a moment. So right here on the route is where that tall overpass goes over your head. And as soon as you start going under that overpass, things change dramatically from downhill to suddenly what was downhill is a dramatic steep quarter mile uphill from, thir from the third quarter of a mile in to one mile. You're now what you just dropped maybe 75 feet from looking at this elevation chart. I confess I don't have exact numbers on elevation gains and losses, except for kind of looking at this meager chart. Um, so some of this is a little off and I will show you my Excel spreadsheet and how it's a little off, but you know, it's pretty darn close. I should tell you all that I was in charge of the pace leaders for the Rose, excuse me, the rock and roll Pasadena half marathon years ago. For two years, they did this race. I was in charge both years of the pace lead, the official pace leaders, and I actually ran the 215. And what you're about to see on my Excel spreadsheet is something that I created back then that I today altered slightly after really deep diving into these numbers and figure recalculating. But I really didn't change much, honestly, even though I recalculated every number at all kind of came out to be the same. So at any rate, you are now going from, what is that, like 50 foot of elevation to maybe like, uh, excuse me, you're going from 750 foot elevation uh, up to about 
810 feet elevation. So it's about a 60 foot climb right there and quarter mile. So suddenly right there, right off the bat in the first mile, you have a huge uphill. Now my numbers on my spreadsheet that I'm gonna show you don't really reflect the drop and the increase. They just have you like going up maybe 10 feet and that's about it in the first mile because it's the first mile. I only do calculations for one mile at a time, but clearly within that one mile, that three quarter of a mile drop, um, whoops, let me put the little puppy down. There we go. Um, she wanted to go down. Um, between that three quarter of a mile drop and that one quarter of a mile steep incline, uh, that's dramatic shift in pace. That's all I can tell you. It, it's not reflected in my first mile on my spreadsheet, but you can see it very clearly looking at that elevation map. Um, right as you go over that, excuse me, as you go under that overpass, right in this area, right in here somewhere, that huge overpass that goes right over your head, maybe 50 feet above you, um, right there, pace leaders, is where you need to announce, because we are the official pace leaders of this whole shooting match, no shooting, just never mind, you know, um, you need to announce right there at mile three quarter, okay, everybody, let's slow down, save the glycogen. And if anybody asks you what your game plan is, if it's about pace and, oh, I'm just gonna follow my watch, or far worse than that, if it is about, oh, I'm gonna put a little money in the bank, meaning you're gonna go out a little faster so you can slow down toward the end, eesh, you will probably get people walking away from you if they know anything about pace leading and they, you will never see them again on the course. And that'll be at the start of the race. Um, so really the motivation for our pace leaders, what our game plan is, really what it would hopefully be for any race that you do as a pace leader anywhere, would be we are going to finish on time, but we are going to use, uh, we're gonna calculate pace based on glycogen consumption and elevation, heat, hills, headwinds, all get calculated into pace, as you're gonna see on my pace chart that I'll show you in just a minute. But, okay, so we're at mile one. At mile one, you, you've absolutely needed to slow down consistently, pretty significantly in that one quarter of a mile, which you will not see in my spreadsheet because you see the whole mile. Um, it's only like, what? from here to here is like a 10 foot increase total, but it goes down 75 feet, up like 75, 80 feet. All right, anyway, um, from mile one, you now have a decline. It's a little flat. You're now rolling around this hill here. You're kind of on, it's, you know, it's a little, a little downhill. You're going from mile one down to mile two. This area, like I say, kind of rolling around the hill is fairly, you know, you can see it, there is a sort of flat downhill quality to it. And then an even bigger drop, but then a mile and three quarters in until almost mile three, you have a massive, almost, what is that? About a 190 foot climb in a mile and a quarter, a 190 foot climb from about here to up to, well, really here. The top of the hill is here. This is Colorado. You can see Colorado Boulevard. Um, this corner right here where I will be standing on the opposite side of the street, you'll be running right at me, but you'll be taking a right turn. Um, and I will be taking your picture, um, so smile. Um, right there is really the top of the hill once you turn right onto Colorado. But from here, from really here 
to here or from here to here on my elevation chart, that is a serious uphill. 190 foot climb, roughly, give or take. Um, you all need to slow it way down. Now, here's the reality. You may find this intriguing or unbelievable, I don't know. But hear me out. Our fastest runners in group one have something very much in common on this hill, especially, with our slowest walkers in walk six. I know this sounds weird. Jose, you and Miguel have something very much in common. And that's that the range of pace that you guys can have as a variance is, is much more limited to like 30, maybe 40 seconds even, as steep as that hill is, and we'll talk about this in, in a moment as it pertains to glycogen consumption and time on the course, there are some differences obviously between walk one, run one and walk six, but your variation in pace for both these groups is similar to like 30, 40 seconds per mile slower going up that hill. And that's consistent as you go down to group two, three, four, and as you come up from walks five, four, three, you know, that there is this, you get a slightly more and more, I should say more and more and more variance in pace. So you could actually slow it down more and more and more. So when you get to say groups run five through run walk two, that's kind of the peak. You could really, those groups can really drop as much, although it's gonna change for each group, could really drop as much as maybe a minute and a half going up that hill. So the fastest and slowest have a narrower range of dropping your pace going up that hill. The middle groups have a wider range of pace or slower going up that hill, if that makes sense because you want to finish on time. Now, here's the other variable for group one, really group one only. Um, if you were, you got everybody, all human beings have about 80 to 90 minutes of glycogen at slightly higher intensity, like you're going to be going at half marathon race pace. So after about 80, 90 minutes, you could theoretically hit the wall if you're going just a little faster than you should be based on your ability level, right? If you're a little faster than half marathon race pace. So group one at, and I'd have to do the math on this to make sure I'm correct, but I'm guessing Miguel's group will finish at about an hour 30. Well, there's your 90 minutes. So Miguel really, doesn't need to worry about dropping his pace that much. Yes, everyone wants to start out a little bit slower. And then by the end, look at that nice downhill glide into the finish from mile like 11 and a half all the way to 13.1. You got this nice downhill. You can just fly as you'll see on my spreadsheet. Um, but groups one, you're pretty much okay with glycogen consumption. You could almost screw it up completely, almost. You don't, you, again, you wanna start a little slower, you wanna finish faster at the end, but you guys are within that 90 minute range. Now, group one on a marathon, whole different ball game. You wanna start slow, finish fast, but you got way longer to go. You need to definitely take in gels. You definitely would benefit from taking in maybe group one, a gel somewhere in the middle or whatever, or right before you start just to up your glycogen, you up your glycogen reserve. Um, all the other groups, you got more than 80, 90 minutes to go. So everybody calculate where will you be when you finish uh, excuse me, where will you be with 80 minutes to go? So figure this out because it's simple. 
if you have a 10 minute pace group, 10 minute per mile, and you got 13 miles, that's roughly 10 minute per mile pace would be 131 something minutes, right? 131 minutes. So minus uh, 80 minutes, 80 minus 131 would be, what is that? Uh, 52, 51 minutes, something like that. And divide that by 10, that would be five, roughly mile 5.2. Did I totally screw that up? Uh, someone with far better math than I would be able to count, but I do recall about mile five and a half or so is about where the 10 minute per mile pace group is beyond that 80 minutes to go. Got it? You have about, yeah, about eight miles, five, eight miles to go. 10 minutes per mile pace, 80 minutes. There you go. A little like 5.1 to the finish line, a 10 minute per mile group could theoretically start hold back up till mile 5.1 and then they could speed it up a little bit, a little bit, a little bit until you get to here and then you can speed it way, way up. But there are variances in between. So say a 10 minute per mile pace group could really drop, that would be our group six, could really drop at least on that uphill a minute, minute and a half per mile. But look at this, the first quarter mile is even steeper than the next mile from mile, what is that? Mile two to mile two and almost three quarter. Um, before that, mile one and three quarter to two is far steeper than the rest of that climb. So even there, your early pace, it could hit two minute per mile pace on that uphill and then maybe a minute 30 from here till the top of Colorado, right, right there, Colorado Boulevard at the top. And you will see the end of the street. You will see people taking a right turn and you will know when they start taking a right turn, that's the end of the hill. You'll see it very clearly coming up. But even there, uh, now again, groups one and walk six, your variance, your ability to slow it significantly more than 30, 40 seconds is less but maybe this part of it would be 30 seconds slower, 25 seconds slower, and this portion would be maybe 40 seconds slower for one, run one and walk six. And then everybody else kind of expands on that. I hope that makes sense. Um, from, from mile three, well, really, we'll start from here. It's pretty much the same. You have a little downhill. There's a little rolling on Colorado Boulevard. Uh, you do take a little detour off to another street. But this whole area in here is kind of rolling flat from the top, the corner of Colorado, all the way to the end here. And I apologize, I'm not, I forgot what the name of this street is, but it parallels Colorado right here. Um, you could see right here, it's pretty rolling. Uh, but then at mile seven, right here, see, keep in mind, you, you run down here, you do a U-turn, and then you go back up, and then here's mile six, and then you do a U-turn, and you come back up. This is identical to the rock and roll Pasadena race that I was in charge of. Same exact coordinates, mileage, everything. Um, but then at mile seven, you're now coming back. And what was this downhill here on Colorado uh, in here is now going to be this uphill sort of in here, right? So you're now from seven, you're go now going to eight and then nine is a little beyond, but then nine you start, you hit the freeway. Um, right here, I don't know if you can see this. So we start over here as the Rose Bowl up here in the green. We run down to run all the way around to all the way down around and back. Now here is the freeway. So you're now going down this 
rather steep decline because you got to get back to the Rose Bowl. The Rose Bowl, this whole area is a depressed area. So one, you got to climb out of it. And then two, you got to run back down into it and around it. Okay. So this is a whole different story now. So if you make it back up to about mile three, right here is the Norton Simon on your right will be the famous Norton Simon Museum, right? Right. Well, number two, that's the Norton Simon Museum. There's the little picture. Um, right after you pass that, you will go on the entry ramp to the freeway. It may be an exit ramp, I don't remember. Regardless, it's closed. You will be closed, the whole ramp will be closed, the whole bridge will be closed. It's us and us alone. Don't worry about it. You're not running on a freeway, nobody at any time, uh, <clears throat> not with cars. At any rate, <clears throat> so as you'll see, you have this dramatic decline. So you've held back here, you've really held back in here, <clears throat> save that glycogen. You've got a little downhill, you know, you're still holding back. So even though it's downhill, my spreadsheet, you'll see, is really kind of marathon race pace, not faster, even though it's a little downhill. You know, you're not really speeding up here, even though it's a little downhill, because you're holding out for that 80 minute to go. Now, again, group two, three, four, you're, you're going to be, you could, group two, three, four, you could use this downhill because you'll be within that 80 minutes to go. If you calculate it out, I'm not sure exactly where you hit that 80 minutes to go, but you guys can change my spreadsheet and add from right here to right here, maybe a little tiny bit faster, maybe a hair faster. Um, but everybody else, you're still holding back, waiting to get out of the red zone, waiting to get into that zone where you're 80 minutes to go, where you can start really depleting that glycogen reserve. Got it? I know this is so def defined, I apologize. But, so you hit, you're a little uphill from that mile six over here, heading back. There's a little uphill there, um, but then you get a real, and you could slow down a little bit. Most of our groups somewhere around here are gonna hit 80 minutes to go. So you could even get up to half marathon race pace, even a little bit on that incline, as long as you have that 80 minutes left to go. I leave that all to you guys, everyone, to calculate for yourselves, but, Right there, you're entering that exit for the, the, the what is it, the Caseco Bridge, whatever that bridge is, that beautiful bridge, right in here, the, what is that called, Cor Corio Seco something bridge, anyway, that's this bridge right here. You get to the turnaround point on that bridge, it's really a fair sharp turn you're going down a pretty steep angle right here, downhill. And then you kind of, there actually rock and roll had a band that you were running right at a grandstand right there, which made that curve even tighter, which we will not have a band right there because I felt like I wanted to jump on the bandstand. I was going so fast. Then you take a very sharp turn right there and you are still going down, down, and down, as you can see um, on that, there's a little uphill, like I said, right after you hit that, that sharp curve, that right there, what is that, about nine and a half, a uh, little over nine, that sharp curve, suddenly you hit a, a little tiny but severe uphill, which almost all our groups are gonna be within that 80 minutes to go outside of that red zone um, our, our slower groups will still have to take that little thing slower, but most of our groups can just kind of plow up that. It's only like, what, a quarter mile, not even uphill, but it's a fairly good uphill. Then you're still rolling down and up and up, and, and you're rolling down here for a fair amount, a bit, 
until you get to the bottom again, right around here somewhere. Let's see on our map. Right around, yeah, about mile, a little after mile 10 and a quarter, you're really starting an ascension from mile 10. You're now going around the golf course, right? You're now going around the golf course and it is rolling, but it is, actually, I can tell you this, from right here on the side of the, um, from the side of the Rose Bowl, from the side, there's a little walking path from like right across here, which I ran, and I started my, my watch, and from right here on that road, all the way up to here, right here, um, and I'll explain that spot in a minute. You do, it is rolling, but you do in, have a, an increase in elevation that according to my watch at least was 60 feet. So you are on this side of the golf course all the way to here going up 60 feet total. Got it? So on the other hand, almost all of you are gonna be within, I think everybody, Everybody is going to be within 80 minutes to go when from mile 10 to mile 13. Let, let me think that through. Is there any group that would take 80 minutes to get three miles? No. So, okay. <clears throat> so all of you can, you may want to lower your pace a little bit, but I, as you'll see on my spreadsheet, it's even still a little faster than half marathon race pace because in this area here, even though it's a slight rolling uphill, you can start really using that glycogen. You can raise your heart rate. Remember, the higher your heart rate, the more glycogen you use. Well, you're within that 80 minute to go. You've held back, you pretty much, your glycogen's on full, glycogen levels are on full. Maybe you've taken in a gel or two to add more glycogen. Um, it takes maybe 10, possibly as much as 15 minutes for that high glycemic gel or gummy bear or whatever it is you're taking um, to get into your system. Honestly, you could be eating cookies if you could swallow it. The processed sugar is high glycemic junk, but because you're going at high intensity, your body just absorbs it like crazy and turns it into glycogen pretty quickly, where normally if you ate that stuff, it, that junk process, gel or cookie or gummy bear, um, frankly, I think it's all the same, um, you're, you will spike your insulin levels and you will crash your energy. But because you're running, your body absorbs it quickly. You don't spike your, your insulin levels, not, not anywhere near as much as if you were just standing still eating a box of cookies, which I think we can all relate to from our childhood. What does that do to your energy levels eating a box of cookies? Not just does it make you sick, but at any rate, do this gels I think pretty much would do the same thing if you were sitting there eating a package of gels. You'd pretty much the same. Anyway, um, right here is kind of an oddity but it's a visual that you can remember where there is this little, it's more of a drainage ditch. It looks like a stream, it'd be really pretty. And no, it's kind of like a drainage ditch that goes under the road. But the reason I, may, I point this out is there is this little concrete incline that goes over, you know, the, the entire street becomes this slight incline that goes over this drainage ditch. Now it may only go up like five, seven feet maximum. It's really not much. And maybe you faster runners will cross it in about three steps, four steps. Walkers, obviously more steps, but you'll cross over pretty quick. The reason I point it out is before this little lump, we'll call it, in the road, um, you're going uphill. After the lump, it's kind of this hill over a drainage ditch, you're going down. So as soon as you cross that hump in the road, 
and you'll see like a little trickling polluted water on either side. I don't know what. It, anyway, um, the game sort of changes from you've been running maybe a little faster or walking a little faster uh, than marathon, half marathon race pace, like walkers maybe 10 seconds, five seconds faster than half marathon race pace. This whole strip in here, even though it is 60 foot uphill from here to here, it, it's actually still a little more uphill in this area. I just didn't have my watch on. At any rate, I didn't run that area. I have in the past, but that's another story. This was three, four weeks ago. I, I recorded from here. I ran all the way around the 5K and it was 60 feet from here to, to here. Anyway, from here, all bets are off. Whatever you were doing before, forget about it. Forget about the watch. Pace leaders, I, I know this sounds horrible. Forget about your group. Just go for it. Everybody, start to speed up. There's a little water table over here, if I recall correctly, usually around that corner. And, you know, grab your last drink of water. And then once again, go for it all the way downhill, down to here. And then you're running into the Coliseum. And I think from here to here, that 0.1 mile um, is, is negligible difference, uh, unnegligible difference. It's, it's just like flat. But you got a good solid mile plus of just nice gliding downhill. Let me show you. This nice gliding downhill from, what is it, 11 and three quarter, um, all the way down to the finish at 13.1. That's a, over a mile and a quarter, mile and a half, mile and a third, somewhere around there, where you're dropping a good 100, 100 feet. A good 100 foot drop, it's a lot like Ocean Avenue between Colorado and the, the, the totem pole, or I should say between Colorado and San Vicente. It's kind of that, well, that would be an incline. If you were going from San Vicente down to California Street, that's kind of what it's like. It's this unseen 100 foot meter, 100 foot drop. It's actually more than Ocean Avenue. It is more than Ocean Avenue there. Not much. It's not a real visual drop. It is sort of an unseen drop, but it is a drop. But you got all that glycogen, that's the point you can really pour it on. And, you know, I had people say to me, one woman was tearful at the end of the race. She said, I lost you at mile 11 and a half, right up here, right after the drainage ditch hump, you know, where I started speeding up. She said, but I could see you the whole way. And I want to thank you so much, tears in her eyes, because you got me a PR, lifetime PR, even with all those hills. And I, I hope all of you, pace leaders, have that experience like I know Miguel did at the end of the last LA Marathon, where people were thanking him um, for helping him, them have a PR and slow it down. The key is announce it right in there, right early on in your race. We all need to slow down now, save the glycogen, save the glycogen, save the glycogen. Let's all slow down. I did that and I got a group going with me. Um, uh, I did not have a pace group. I, I was carrying a sign and I was an official pace leader. Um, we didn't have groups like we do now with the Roadrunners. It was everybody. And I created a group right there, <clears throat> right there by just calling it out. And some people went by me right in that little area right there. And I was like, oh, God. And sure enough, right in this area between mile eight and mile nine over here in this area, headed back this way, 
um, they had already done all this, headed back, that's where I saw all the people who passed me by in this short little area, I saw them again. And actually a couple of people cursed my sign. Ah, oh, that right. Two, 215 was my pace, my finish time. And there were some people who cursed me as I ran by them and they were struggling in this little area right here. And there is a little uphill in this area and we were all feeling great because we held back in right in here and then again, right from here to here. This is the big clincher from here to here, that huge uphill from there to there. But it starts right in here, right in this area before mile one, that quarter of a mile right in there, that uphill right there, right there, that steep uphill. If you lose them there, you will see them again and they will be struggling. That is such a critical, critical element to this race. And as you will see at mile three on my spreadsheet that I'm about to show you very briefly, I was 10% slower. Now again, walk six, run one, you're not gonna be as, you may be 5%, got it? And everybody in the middle will be, you know, more and more and more, more like my 10% uh, as you get toward the middle groups. But, or I should say middle groups. Anyway, um, right there at mile three, I was 10% slower with a 10.18 per mile pace, 10.16 per mile pace, something like that. You'll see it in a minute. I was clearly three minutes and some change behind schedule. Three minutes behind schedule. Again, walk six, run one, narrowed, won't be that much, but that's huge. And yet I used, uh, I used these downhills here and especially this one here and my 80 minutes to go even the little downhill right here, even the uphill right in through here when I had less than 80 minutes, I was under 80 minutes to go. Screw the glycogen, let's start using it in here. So I was up to half marathon race pace and even a little faster, even though here I was going uphill, but here and here I was really holding back. You see the difference even though you know, right, this is a fairly good hill for a good quarter of a mile. You're going up like 50 feet, 50, maybe 60 feet right there on that quarter, half mile, quarter mile, third of a mile, I guess. That, But even there, maybe I slowed down a hair, but not much because I had, I was within, I was under that 80 minutes to go. And I think almost all of our groups from mile almost nine to 13, what is that, like four miles to go? Yeah, you would have to be like, what, 20 minute per mile pace? And you would be under that 80 minutes to go, am I correct, something like that? Yeah, about four miles to go, right there, four and a quarter miles to go, you're all gonna be under that 80 minute to go mark. So even that little hill there, all of us, even our walk six, can push it a little faster than half marathon race pace, even though you're going up a hill. And then look at this kaboom, you're going down that, that Arroyo Seco Bridge, that's the name of it, sorry. Arroyo Seco Bridge, that beautiful bridge with all those lamps on the side, you're going down that bridge. Um, so right there, you can really speed up there. Um, if anyone has any knee issues, um, that area over here where you enter the Arroyo Seco downhill bridge, it's a good solid downhill. Um, shorten and quicken your stride and do not push off. Just pick your feet up and put them down. Pick your feet up and put them down. Just quicker, quicker, quicker. So you're touching the ground more, more quickly and you will feel more like you are rolling down that hill. Your speed will pick up your energy level won't increase that much and your, your energy output, your heart rate, your breathing rate won't increase much, 
but just pick your feet up and put them down and you won't have that pounding on your knee. If you're really reaching out with your leg and landing, yes, the higher your knee goes, the faster you will go on that downhill, but man, the landing and the crashing on your leg. And if you have any issues with your knee, do not do that. You need to alter your running stride. You know, pick your feet up and put them down. Don't push off. Just pick your feet up and put them down. Let gravity just throw you down that hill and you will feel much, much, much less pounding on your knees. For those of you who have any knee issues, right in this area here, especially right after mile nine, right in that area right there, um, especially right before and going over that Arroyo Seco Bridge. Um, so we've covered the map and the elevation. Let me switch as quickly as I can to another screen, which is my spreadsheet. Now, take a look at this and then I'm done. I'm just gonna go through this quickly. I, I kind of visually from that elevation chart as limited the, as the data is, truthfully, um, I, I just kind of winged it and kind of took a good guess. But as you'll see, and as you kind of heard, the elevation gains and losses do not dramatically Im impact the weight factor. And I'll explain that in a second. By the way, anyone who wants a copy of this, let me know, I'll, I'll email to you. Um, it's just a standard Excel spreadsheet. It dot, did not completely um, change the weight factor of the hills, the terrain, which, in, which changes your pace. Um, this was calculated in so that by mile five, you're really right there by mile five, you're really a little after that, you got about 80 minutes to go. So this really was average pace in this yellow, you can see 10 minute, 18 second per mile pace. And whoops, let me go up a little higher. Um, the finish time was 10, two hours and 15 minutes. Got it? If you wanna change this, you still have to use an AM. You can't just change the numbers but say for instance, you wanna change everything to a, a 130. Let's take a look. Uh, 130 AM, if you don't have the AM, my algorithm won't work. So here you go. 130 finish time on a half marathon would be a 652. You can see all your times, your paces have just automatically changed. Got it? Um, but, this wouldn't really take into consideration the 80, 90 minutes left to go because really, you know, from the beginning, you're within like 90 minutes left to go. Um, so some of the weight factor over here can change. Uh, if you change this to three hours, um, things change dramatically again. There you go you're now averaging 1344 pace, a little different. Now your 80 minutes to go is gonna be, oh good grief, what's 13 divided by, what is it, like mile 10, something like that? I'm just guessing, my math is terrible. So somewhere around mile nine, 10, somewhere around here, um, your three hour group that's where before that you're in the red zone, be careful. Some of this may need to be altered, but this whole area in here, now you're, you're 80 minutes left to go. Whoops. Now you're like 80 minutes left to go to the finish. Um, there are some elements to my algorithm that are off slightly. And if any of you really genius Excel spreadsheet people can figure it out, where I've gone wrong, please let me know. Um, for example, my elevation calculations, these are my calculations based on that elevation chart. Um, it should be zero. The sum should be zero. And as you can see, the sum is 45. So it's not perfect. It's just a good calculated, educated guess. Um, 
But I'll show you something if we go back to that 215 time with the first three miles that you may find interesting. 215. Um, here you go. Take a look at the finish time. This is mile three right there. Got it. Mile three finishes right as I told you, three minutes under, three minutes, 15 seconds, under the average pace, sort of. I mean, it's 10, 18 average pace, but it's well, uh, it's about a minute per mile slower. And it's really, most of that is miles like two to almost miles three, a little before mile two to the to Colorado, almost mile three. That's three minutes behind schedule. And yet, if you look at the bottom here, well, this is a little off. This algorithm is a little off. We do finish at like almost 215. It says 21406. It really should say 215, but it's the algorithms are pretty darn close. They're pretty close uh, at the finish line. So even there, I actually can tell you I finished the first year I did it, this pace, this chart, I actually took this chart from when I did it at Rock and Roll. I, I had done this years ago. I altered it today a little bit, but it really almost, it came out to be pretty much everything the same, really. Um, at any rate, um, all my points were right where I hit. I ended up 20 seconds, per, 20 seconds too fast. So instead of this 215, I ended up with 214.40. And the second year I did it, I was a little faster. I ended up with 214.22, something like that. So even though both years, three minutes behind schedule and mile three, huge variance, um, I ended up under that 215 mark, um, mostly because of that last mile. We all just, you know, we were, we were on, on point to finish at about 215. And that last mile, we really just took off, sped up. And like I said, I knocked out 40 seconds the second year and about over 20 seconds the first year. Had I just held it to half marathon race pace, we would have finished comfortably, but we had tons of glycogen left, all of us, because we did it right. We held back and we did it right. Um, you can see the pace variations for this 215 finish time. Again, faster runners, slower walkers, and even slower run walkers, run walk five, four, five, well, we don't have four, five, run walk five, six, and slower. The variances are not going to be as much as what you see here. But here is mile one, 10.36, 10.42. Bam! Mile two to mile three. Look at that. Almost 12 minute per mile pace. I'm averaging a 10.16 and I'm going up that hill at almost 12 minute per mile pace. That's, what is that, about a minute 45 average slower? for that 10, 16 per mile average pace, that 12, almost 12 minute per mile. So then I'm a little faster. Uh, mile five is a little bit of downhill. We dropped 40 feet. And that's also where red zone ends for this 215 pace group. And the green zone, let's use that glycogen. So we're now up to 10, we're now a little faster, 10 minute per mile pace, oh, we're a second second off that. So we've just sped up 17 seconds faster than average race pace. Does anyone see a 1017 on here anywhere? No, our average pace, 1018, excuse me, 1018. Does anybody see a 1018 anywhere there? Not one. So you tell me if you, if someone asks you, what is your game plan? And you tell them, well, I'm going to run this at pace, just, you know, using my watch. They, if they know anything about following a pace leader, they will know from past bad experiences, you are not the person to follow. Because look at the variance in paces. 
again, faster, slower, we'll have a narrow variance in pace, but still there is a, a, a variance in paces per mile with those elevation changes, because look at that, you're going up 80 feet, you're dropping 80 feet, get the picture, what goes up now goes down. Um, you're climbing out of the Rose Bowl, you're going back down into the Rose Bowl, um, and just hold it off and then use it at the end. Uh, the other pace, the, I, I've heard this from pace leaders before, official pace leaders, not us, but other races. And they say, well, I'm gonna put a little money in the bank, meaning they're gonna go out a little faster so because they anticipate the group is gonna burn out and slow down toward the end. And so they'll be able to slow down toward the end. Well, take a look at the hill right here. Mile two to mile three, you're going up 80 feet. You're gonna put a little money in the bank, meaning going faster than that 10, 18 pace. You're gonna put money in the bank there. What the heck do you think is gonna happen to your group when you hit these miles when it's downhill? Um, whoops, downhill or varying. Um, they're going to be dropping like flies. You will finish with no one. Um, so please don't tell anyone or don't put money in the bank, meaning going out fast. Go out painfully slow, especially mile two to mile three. Got it right, right that, look at that. 11.56 right off of, I have a conservative mile one and two. Even though you're going downhill, I even, even though, you kind of, you know, you kind of go down a little up, but still you start that incline at the end of, you know, that little incline uh, at the, to the last, the third quarter, remember? So you do go down and then you have a quarter of a mile back up again until that right after that it starts. So really mile one um, the average pace you really can't use because at the beginning you're going down a little and then that last third mile three quarter to mile one you're starting that first incline of about a half mile or whatever it is. So we have probably a zero climb average for that first mile because you go down then you go up to about where you started um, at mile one. But even I still have a pretty conservative mile one. You're not going off to the races at the starting line. That even though it's a slight downhill the first three quarter mile, it's still a fairly conservative first mile. You know, I, you're not 10, 18, you're 10, 36 average. Get the pace, the idea. Then you're going up the hill, you're slowing it down a little more, but even still it's a little uphill, then it goes down a little at the end of mile two. And then it starts going up from mile two to mile three. But um, even there, it's a pretty, it's not that 1018, it's still pretty conservative. Then bam, mile two to mile three, just plummet in pace. This, this is the key to the Rose Bowl half marathon. And I've gone way over time and I know this is way too much detail for one, it's a pretty great race. I swear to you, if you get it right, it's the greatest roller coaster ride on the planet. You will love, love, love this race. There are huge places where you can get it right and have a fast finish time and a killer finish time. That last downhill from little right over that drainage ditch, whatever you want to call it, that thing to the finish line is just a great experience when you have that glycogen left over because you've held back early on. It's a thrill. I cannot tell you enough. It is a thrill. And then running into the Rose Bowl, that's just the greatest. That is the greatest. How do you get through water tables? You guys are gonna to have to kind of calculate that out yourselves based on per mile pace. Obviously, run one is going to be grabbing cups of water. Pinch that cup, everybody. Pinch that cup so you kind of have make a little V in the cup. You know, you have a round cup 
And if you pinch one side of it as you grab the cup, pinch that side of it, and then you can down it from that V makes like a little funnel and it won't go all over your face. If it's a round cup, it'll go all over your face, up your nose, in your ears. But if it's you pinch the cup, it'll go right in more of it, it'll go right in your mouth more quickly. So that's a huge point that you can practice this Saturday on getting through water tables. Have fun, everybody. And we'll see you Saturday. And we'll see you all at the finish line.